I will admit, I had multiple people come up to me after the first service and ask if we were starting a series on Downton Abbey. Um, I don't know why they said that. I'm not that familiar with it, but maybe you felt the same way. That's not any way related to what it is that we're doing. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Chris. I'm lead pastor here at Hoboken Grace. And we are actually going back to a conversation for the next six weeks that we started in 2015. So we started this series in 2015, and we're not redoing the series. This is a continuation of that series because in 2015, we sat down and said, okay, we need, we need to help people, and we need to help our family. We need to help people understand how to engage Scripture, and we need to help people understand how to be able to read it, study it, understand it in a way in which it brings life. And so we decided, okay, we're not just going to teach people this. We want to demonstrate it. And so since 2015, once a year about, we've been jumping back into this series and working our way through the book of Acts. Now, if you don't know what the book of Acts is, it's a really significant book inside of scripture because it tells the story of the church, the launch of the church, how it began, how it was formed, how God worked and moved in order for it to become a reality. And so your whole life is impacted by this book of Acts. And we wanted to be able to walk through this book in such a way that you understood, okay, how do I, or how should I, what are the things that I should pay attention to as I engage Scripture? And from the beginning, we called it this crazy book. Now, the reason that we did that is this. I think sometimes for some of us, We've been so exposed to the stories of Scripture, especially if you grew up inside of church. But even if you didn't, there's stories that you've heard about or you've been told of or that you've heard reference to. We've been exposed to these. And what happens is the more that you're exposed to a story, the more that you lose, you, you lose your ability to actually experience it. You lose your amazement at it. And sometimes this can happen with scripture, where we've been so, even if you look last week at the story of Jonah and how we're walking through the book of Jonah, it's really easy because you heard the story of Jonah when you were a child in a children's Bible, or maybe you've heard someone talk about it. It's really easy to read through the story of Jonah and say, oh yeah, that makes sense. That's not at all how you should read the story of Jonah. You should read the story of Jonah and say, that's crazy. You should read the story of Jonah and say, what? What just happened there? How does that happen? You should be in awe. You should be amazed. But sometimes we lose that. We lose that because, one, maybe we're not being honest about what's happening inside the story. We lose that because we've been exposed to it so many times that it just loses its power. And one of the things that I think is significant is that as you engage scriptures, you need to engage scriptures like you're reading it for the very first time. And one of the first things I want to teach you as you're engaging scripture is that when you come to scripture, you should sit down with your Bible and read it like you've never heard it before. Try to force yourself to do that. One of the ways that I do that in my own life is that I have multiple Bibles inside of my office. One of my Bibles I take notes in. So when I see something significant, I'll jot down a note inside of that Bible. That Bible I don't read on a consistent basis. I never read that Bible when I'm sitting down to study or to engage in my personal time with God. The reason I don't is because every time I read that Bible, I only see what I saw before. Because my notes dictate everything that I'm going to understand about that passage. Because I remember what I saw before. I remember what I took a note on before. So I never read that one. I'll reference it when I'm studying things, but I never read it. I read one without notes. Why? Because I want to experience it like I've never experienced it before. I never want to lose this. And I never want to lose it because I never want for for me to stop understanding my own amazement of what God has done and how God moves. Another reason why I never want to lose this is I never want to lose the perspective of some of you who are encountering God's word for the very first time. And I know what you think when you read the story. 
You read the story and you think, that's crazy. And some of you have a hard time interacting with your Christian friends because they'll tell you crazy stories, but they act like they're not crazy, which makes you think they're crazy. And so I never want, I never want to lose that. And I think it's actually critical that you don't lose that. And so I try to always come to it like I've never experienced it before. Now, as I said, we don't want to just teach you this. We want to actually demonstrate this to you. And so we're going to pick up where we left off a couple years ago when we were in the midst of the series. We're going to pick up in Acts chapter 9. Now, the church has already launched, but we're going to jump right into it because I think this will actually demonstrate part of what we want to teach. So Acts chapter 9, it says this. It says, Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. So this is where we're picking up. Now, I just want to point something out because some of you, you're reading this and saying, well, what in the world? Who's Saul? You have all sorts of questions. This, this leads you to all sorts of questions. Who is, who is Saul? Why is he growing more powerful? Where in the world is Damascus? And what... And, and I, I point this out because you need to understand this about how you engage Scripture. And many of you do this. A lot. It's, it's amazing how many of us do this. We think, we think Scripture is a magical book. So we engage, we engage Scripture unlike any other book in our lives. So some of you, the way that you engage Scripture is this. You say, well, you know, I, I probably ought to read my Bible. And so you just flip open your Bible, and you start reading. And, and as you start reading, nothing makes sense. And I'll have conversations with people, and they'll tell me that. Tell, you know, I've, I've been trying it. Like, I flipped open on Monday, and I didn't understand anything, and I flipped open on Tuesday. They didn't even flip open to the same place. It's just randomly. They just flip open. They put their finger down, and it's like, well, this is a magical book. I'm supposed to flip open. I put my finger down, and God's going to speak to me. That's how it works. And it's just going to open to the right place. It's like a Harry Potter book. <laughs> and we would never say that out loud, but that's actually how we engage it. You wouldn't read any other book in your life that way. What other book would you just randomly flip open and be like, you know what, I bet I'll understand this. Right here, just randomly in the middle of it. And if you do that in Acts, to Acts chapter 9, you're not going to understand any of it either. You're say, who in the world is Saul? I don't know where he came from. I don't know what he's doing. I don't understand. Scripture's so hard to read. It's so hard to read. I don't think I can understand it. Well, we just, you're coming to it the very wrong way. I used to try to counteract this. I had the opportunity to teach college pastors for a while, and I had the opportunity to teach them how to be able to read Scripture. That was my job as part of the staff. And, and I always shocked them because we would come into the beginning of class and they would expect me to give them a Bible, but I wouldn't. I'd give them Shakespeare's sonnets. And I'd say, okay, we're going to learn how to be able to read these. And they'd say, what in the world? Why are we not reading the Bible? I said, because you think it's a magical book. And so you interact it different, with it differently than you do other literature. And that's a, that's a massive problem. And, and one of the things that you have to understand if you're going to read through Scripture well is that you need to read through it systematically. You can't just randomly jump into it. And part, part of this is that we think, we think that all of Scripture is just Proverbs. I think many of us have this idea. There is actually a book in Scripture called Proverbs, and it has a bunch of one- and two-line statements that exist on their own and are wisdom. But it's one of the books in Scripture, not a large portion of Scripture, just one of them. The rest of it isn't. And so it's important that you actually read through it systematically. You need to read through books from the beginning to the end. You need to understand that the Bible is not just one book. It's a collection of all sorts of different books. And it's actually important that you understand where to start. Oftentimes people will ask me, well, where should I start? It's actually a significant and important question. And some of you start from Genesis, and you're like, it's very difficult to understand. And if you start from Genesis, you're going to find that. But because, and this is really important for you to note, and when we say we want for you to start with the Christian scriptures of the New Testament, it's not just because we want you to start with Jesus. 
It's also because the Jewish scriptures of the Old Testament is written for a different reason and written in a different way than the Christian scriptures or the New Testament. What I mean by that is this. Before Jesus... Everything worked through a priesthood. And so there were priests that had access to God, that would hear from God, that would engage Scripture because Scripture wasn't readily available to regular people. It wasn't distributed amongst regular people. It wasn't even intended to be studied by regular people. It was written for priests to engage with and then to bring the message of God. But as we talked about in our Break Free series, when Jesus steps into the scene, when Jesus gives his life, that priesthood goes away, and the Christian scriptures actually teach us, no, we're all priests once you step into that relationship with God. In other words, when Jesus gives his life on the cross, that, that, that area, the Holy of Holies in the temple, the curtain that separated that area was ripped from top to bottom. What is God saying? Nothing will come between me and my people anymore. You have the same access to God that I have. I am not a priest that has special access and then I receive a message from God that brings it to you. No, I've been tasked with with interacting with, engaging with God's word and engaging with God and helping our family to do that together. But I don't have special access that you don't have. And so the Christian scriptures are written differently. They're written in common everyday Greek and Aramaic. They were written for common people to engage with and to engage God through. That is not the way the Jewish scriptures are written. The Jewish scriptures are complex literature. There's poetry. There's multiple forms of literature that you see inside of the Jewish scriptures. Why? Because they were intended to be interacted with by priests who then would engage the people. It's not written the same way. It's not written for the same purpose. It's not written to be studied the same way. And so it's significant that you start with the New Testament or the the Christian scriptures and to be able to read through, okay, how has Jesus impacted your life? It's also really important that you get a really good grasp on that before you begin to interact with the Jewish scriptures because there are things that are drastically different after Jesus. And because, and and you need to understand this, the Jewish scriptures were given to the Jewish people and most of you are not Jewish. There are a lot of things in there that do not pertain to you at all. And when you read through them and it references to Gentiles, it's talking about you. But there are things that change. So I'll give you an example. And this is one of the big mistakes that people make if they begin to interact with the Jewish scriptures before they interact with the the Christian scriptures. After Jesus comes... Not only does he give you access to God, but after Jesus comes and you step into a relationship with him, Jesus says, I'm going to give you my spirit from the moment of salvation. The Holy Spirit is given to you from the moment of salvation. Before Jesus, in the Jewish scriptures, that never happened. The the Holy Spirit was given to specific individuals for specific amounts of time to carry out a specific task. So it would be given to kings. You you see this with King David and King Saul, two of the earliest kings in the nation of Israel. The Holy Spirit is given to King Saul for a specific time. But when it's time for him to no longer be the king, the Holy Spirit is actually taken from him. Taken from him. And sometimes I'll hear hear believers who place their faith in Christ pray to Jesus and say, please don't take the Spirit of God from me. That doesn't happen after Jesus. That is a reality of the Old Testament, not the New Testament. Because it changed. Prior to Jesus, the Holy Spirit was given for specific time, for specific actions. After Jesus, because of the fact that we're forgiven. Remember, before Jesus, God was looking forward to the sacrifice for our sins, but the sins hadn't actually been forgiven. And so the Holy Spirit wasn't just given to everyone. But after Jesus gives his life, he says, no, now there's nothing between you and me. Therefore, my spirit can dwell with you all the time, forever, never taken from you. But if you don't understand that, you'll pray that you will experience, receive some special thing from the Holy Spirit or that the Holy Spirit will come to you like you don't already have it. You'll you'll misunderstand that. And so that's why we say, okay, you need to start with a really clear understanding of what Jesus has done for you, a really clear understanding of what Jesus has made possible in your life. This is why we often tell people, and some of you right now are wondering, well, where should I start? Start with the story of John. John is Jesus' best friend. It's him writing about who Jesus is. It's a great place. Acts 
as we're walking through this, a great place to be able to start to understand the story of the church. Romans is a really phenomenal book. Actually, one of the books inside of Scripture that's written from a Western mindset. So it's, it's, it's very much a walkthrough of grace. It's, it's very much a textbook of grace and understanding grace and why it wor- what God did and what, make, what that makes possible. Great places to start. But don't start in the middle of the book. Don't start, start at the beginning of the book and read through it. And the other thing that I'll say is this. Uh, when I was in school, one of the most powerful things that I was taught about engaging scriptures happened because we had a professor come to our school that excelled in ancient languages, specifically Middle Eastern languages. And he watched the way that we read scripture, which is the way many of you read scripture. So you'll read it a chapter at a time or maybe half a chapter, and you're trying to dive into it. And I'm going to really understand this chapter, and then I'm going to read a little bit longer, and I'm going to really understand that chapter. And he said, you guys are reading this entirely the wrong way. No one in the Middle East would study this way. These books would never have been read this way. And he began to challenge us to read more faster. He said, I want you to take in more, and I want you to read it faster, and I want you to read it more frequently. Because another mistake that we make, because it's a magical book, is we think, I'm going to understand this the first time I read it. Now, you don't think that about any other book that has any kind of complexity to it. If it's really simple, you might say, well, I think I'm going to understand this the first time I read it. But outside of that, if it has any kind of complexity, you understand, no, it's going to take some time. I'm going to have to work through this to really understand what it's saying. And, and that's definitely true when you look at what Scripture is. Because Scripture is not just a handbook for life. This is God writing to you for you to be able to know him and understand him. And so some say this is God's love letter to the church. Now let me ask you this. You remember the first love letter you ever got? Think about it. Takes you about three seconds to remember, doesn't it? You're like, third grade. I can picture the classroom. I remember what she looked like. You remember like those, those high school love letters that you, some of you aren't old enough to actually know what paper is, but there was a time when we would write things down on paper and then we would give them to another person. Maybe you experienced it on a watch. I don't know, but... You know, what I, you know what I know about your first love letter? You didn't just read it once, did you? Eventually, the folds like ripped apart because you had unfolded it and refolded it so many times. And you're reading into every line, like, what do you think she meant by that? You're talking to your friend, like, what do you think? Do you think? What? You're trying to understand. You under- and... You know, we, but we think, well, I'm just going to understand it the first time. No. And, and I remember this professor used to challenge us. For the, I, I took a class with him, and it changed, changed the way that I engaged Scripture because for the first half of the semester, every single day, we had to read 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. You couldn't read slow if you're going to do that. He said, but I want you to read that every single day for the first ch- half of the, ch- the semester. And then for the second half of the semester, I want you to read the entire book of John, which is John's story of Jesus' life. It's not a short book. He says, I want you to read as fast as you can. I want you to make sure you read it every single day. By the time I finished that, cha- that semester, I understood those books so well. So well. Because of the fact that I was taking them in over and over and over and over and over again. Stop trying to understand all the little pieces, especially with Scripture. It's not written that way. And when you take in more of it, you're going to understand it a lot better because you're going to see themes. Most books in Scripture are written with themes that are woven throughout the entire story, not just communicated in little sections. So you're going to see words that are used over and over and over and over again as you move through this. You're going to see scenarios that play out over and over and over and over again as you read through it. And so take in more of it and don't expect to understand it right away. It's going to come as you understand the whole better, you'll understand the pieces better. Some things are written in a way that you understand the pieces, then you'll understand the whole. That's not the way that Middle Eastern literature is written. It's written that you understand the whole and then you'll understand the pieces. And so change the way that you look at it, the way that you engage it. And then, as I said earlier, don't don't lose sight of the awe, the the craziness of the book. I want to read this to you because I want to make sure that in every service I get this right and I want for you to hear this. God does not expect you to suspend your understanding of reality. He expects you to be in awe of his power over it. 
As you engage scripture, he does not expect you to suspend your understanding of reality that, oh, that should just naturally happen. No, that's not, that's not why he shares with us the miraculous. That's not why he shares with us the, the, the amazing way that he loves us. He doesn't want you to suspend your understanding of reality. He expects you to be in awe of his power over it. Don't allow yourself to lose the awe. And never get to where you just think, well, that's just the way it actually is. No, 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 that's not. God is moving in supernatural ways to be able to love, pursue, and to save us. And we should always live in the reality of that. And so as we look at this, cha- this point in chapter 9 where we begin to pick up this story, we understand, okay, if you don't understand the context, if you just randomly start here, you're not going to understand what's happening at all. Let me go back to that passage. Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. Now, let me give you a little bit of the backstory on this so that we can understand where it is that we're picking up. Saul, and some of you have heard me talk about Saul, oftentimes he's referred to as Paul because his name changes just shortly after this. Paul actually writes a lot of the Christian scriptures or the Jewish scriptures. Or, or the Christian scriptures. Yep, my, word, my mouth is not working. The, the Christian scriptures or the New Testament. And, and so later on, his name is changed to Paul. But at this point, he, actually, he hasn't experienced that yet. And, and when you go back in history, when you look at the beginning of Acts, he hated Christians. And, and you've heard me talk about this before where I've said, listen, if you're here today and you're not really big on Christianity, you'd probably like Saul. Because of the fact that he hated Christians. As a matter of fact, he did everything that he could to try to destroy Christianity. And he traveled, his job was to travel to different cities and kill Christians. That's his job. But then he experiences Jesus, and Jesus steps into his life on the way to Damascus, and he is radically changed, radically saved by Jesus to the point where he not only stops pursuing Christians, but he becomes a Christian, and then he begins to share the message of Jesus with people like crazy. And so you see he grows more and more powerful. He baffled the Jews. One of the the reasons why he could do this is Paul was actually a Pharisee. That's why his job was to destroy Christians. He was a Pharisee, and, and his teacher was regarded as one of the best Jewish teachers of all time. So he knew scripture backwards and forwards. He knew all the prophecies that Christ had fulfilled. He knew it like the back of his hand. He pro- to give you an understanding, if you don't know this about Pharisees, Pharisees had the entire Jewish scriptures memorized. They didn't just know them. They had them memorized. Paul had them Memorized. He could call up any passage at any moment. And so he's beginning to engage the Jewish leaders, and he's proving to them that Jesus is actually the Christ, the one that they've been looking forward to. And so that gives you a little bit of the background. It says, After many days had gone by, the Jews conspired to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. So the Jewish leaders are waiting for him to leave the city so that they can kill him, which is an interesting experience. It, I mean, think about what it must have been like for Paul to be the one who's trying to kill, and now he's the one who's being pursued. He's the one that they want to kill. It says, but his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. And so rather than him exiting through the gate, he goes over the wall in order to be able to escape. And he goes to Jerusalem. Now, when he gets to Jerusalem, it's interesting how this plays out. It says, when he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. So he comes to Jerusalem, and he intends to go meet with the disciples, the apostles. They hear about this, and they don't want anything to do with him. Now, This is where, again, you have to put yourself into the story. You have to put yourself into the story. And that takes a little bit of work. But if you're going to understand this well, you can't just read it like, okay, this is just a story that's way up. No, put yourself into the story. Imagine what it's like. Imagine what it's like to be one of those disciples. And this has been quite a journey for the disciples up to this point. Because they see Jesus being put on that cross, and they think the whole thing's over. And then Jesus dies, 
And then Jesus comes back to life. Jesus dies, worst moment of their life. Jesus comes back, to, comes back to life, best moment of their life. This is incredible. Jesus is back. Then Jesus leaves them. Second worst moment of your life. What's happening here? Then the Spirit comes and all these people come to believe in Christ. And you experience this at the beginning of Acts and the church is launched. This happens Huge high point. Then Stephen, one of the believers in the early church, is executed and put to death. Now, again, put yourself in the story. Many of you have never thought about this as it pertains to Stephen because you haven't put yourself into the story. If you put yourself into the story and you watch Stephen die, what's the question? Will he come back to life? That's what you're wondering. If you actually walk through the story, do the hard work of thinking, what is it like for these guys? What is it like for the, as they, as they encounter these different circumstances and situations, Jesus died, Jesus comes back to life. Okay, does that mean, because Jesus says that he came to bring life, does that mean that the same thing's going to happen for Stephen? Stephen dies. He doesn't come back to life. Okay, what does this look like? Then, then the guy who's trying to kill all the believers comes back and says, I'm a believer. And they're thinking, nope. Not taking that chance. And, and don't think that this wasn't personal. Just to give you an understanding of this, and we saw this a little bit earlier in Acts, which again why, is why it's important when you read through it systematically. Saul was there when Stephen died. We're told that Saul actually held the coats of the guys who stoned him to death so that their coats wouldn't get dirty while they killed him. And he comes back and says, I'm back. I'm a believer. No. And I have to think, because again, put yourself in the story. What what is it that you're thinking? Okay, he's a secret spy. That's what he's doing. Like he's trying to infiltrate the ranks. He's trying to prove that he's a believer. Then he's going to find out who all of us are. And then he's going to have all of us killed. And so this is a real point of tension, let alone the fact that Saul may have actually been responsible for the death of some of their family members. Definitely the imprisonment of them. And they got to figure out what they're going to do. Now, If you don't put yourself in the story, it will be really easy to read through these passages and think, there is nothing for me here. This is just filler in between two other stories. But if you actually put yourself in the story, there's a lot here. And one of the things that you're looking for, especially in narrative scripture, in other words, the story scripture, you're looking for examples. You're looking for good examples to follow, bad examples to follow, examples of how God engages different people in different circumstances and situations. And here we see the disciples are struggling, which should be encouraging for us in the fact that oftentimes we struggle. And Scripture doesn't present us with apostles who are perfect. They struggle. And here they're struggling. I don't know if we actually trust you. I don't know if we can trust you. And for for good reason, they're afraid of him. But I think it also challenges us with something that we looked at in our Jonah conversation. Because it's really easy for us to begin to believe that certain people are beyond the reach of God. And one of the ways that we say it frequently here at Hoboken Grace is, who are you saying no for? 
And all of us have people in our lives that we think, man, there's no way they'd say yes. There's no way that they would actually become a believer. And sometimes it's like it was with Jonah, where we don't actually want them to become a believer because we're so angry with them. Or, but sometimes it's just that we think it's beyond possibility. I mean, think for a moment about the people in your life that you think that about. All of us have people like that. Maybe it's your brother, and you think it's not even worth sharing my story with with him. Or maybe it's your parents. It's not even really worth talking to them about who Jesus is. There's no way that they'd say yes. Or maybe it's your boss. And your boss is a combination of I don't really want them to and I don't think they would say yes. Who is it in your life? I think this, this passage challenges us. If, if we're honest and we put ourselves in the story, it challenges us of who we think is beyond. Like there's no way. There's no way they would actually say yes. But God had radically changed his life. It continues and says, but Barnabas took him, and Barnabas was one that God had sent to Saul or Paul right after he became a believer. It says, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord, and the Lord had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Grecian Jews, but they tried to kill him. They're continuing to try to kill him. When the brothers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. And you see the beginning of Paul's missionary journey, this missionary journey that is going to change the world. But you see this engagement in this, this part of the story where the disciples are struggling to believe that he could say yes, but you also see this unbelievable way that God in his grace has rescued one that everyone thought was beyond reach, which is another story that challenges you if you're here and you think, I'm beyond reach. There's no way God would come for me. He did. He did. And God radically saves Paul, but not just for the purpose of Paul's story. He saves Paul for the purpose of our story. Because your story is different because of Paul's story. And your story is different because of the fact that, that Paul decided to share his story. And so immediately he begins to tell his story of what God's done in his life. And I think this passage challenges us in that way as well, that your story is not just for you. God didn't rescue you just for you. He rescued you because he wants to use you to impact the world around you. And just like Matt's story earlier where we, we heard that story and it it impacted the way that maybe we even think about community, the way that we're going to engage community. The reality is, is that all of us have a story that's not just meant for us. Yeah, it's how God impacted us, but it's not just meant for us. It's meant to impact the world around us. And one of the other things that's significant, if you're going to engage Scripture, and if you're going to engage Scripture well, is that you have to allow it to move you to action. It can't just be something that you learn. It has to be something that you do. It has to be something that you practice. And so as we come to this and we see Paul beginning to share his story, even, even though some people struggle to believe it, he's sharing his story. I want to I challenge you. Have you ever taken the time to share your story? Have you taken the time to share it with our family? We want to give you the chance to do that. If you open up the app, go ahead and take out your phone. Go ahead. You can do it. You can do it now. All of you have them. I love doing this because I see who listens and who doesn't. But you take out your phone. If you open up, if you open up the app, at the, at the top of that app, there's an opportunity for you to share your story. And you say, well, my story is not as significant as Paul's. You have no idea. You have no idea. 
but God did not just rescue you for you. And you see that over and over and over again throughout the book of Acts. God did not just rescue you for you. And I want to encourage you, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be setting up a recording studio right here at 301 Garden Street. You don't have to go anywhere else. You don't have to plan anything else. It's going to be on Sunday. We have times right there that you can sign up for a little 15 minutes. It doesn't have to be a huge story. It's just what is God doing in your life? How has God impacted your life? I want to give you the chance to be able to share that with our family, to act on what we see here in this passage, how Paul's sharing that story, for you to do the same thing. Why? Because if we're going to understand Scripture, we can't just learn about it. We have to act on it. And as we put it into motion, we begin to understand it better, who God is, how God's working, how God wants to work in our lives, just like he worked in theirs. And so I want to encourage you to sign up and share your story. God's given us this phenomenal gift of his word. God's given us this phenomenal gift of scripture. But for many of us, we struggle with it because we've misunderstood it. Our goal over the next six weeks, my prayer for you, my hope for you over the next six weeks, is that you would begin to engage scripture in such a way that you would love it. That you would be hungry for it. Because you begin to get to know God through it. And so we're going to continue through Acts. So that you know the story of Acts. But more importantly, so that you're able to come to know God. Through this incredible gift that he's given you. Will you pray with me? Father... I thank you for the way that you've loved us in this way. I thank you for the way that you come to us in this way. I thank you for this, inc- this incredible gift and tool that you've given us. I pray that we would learn how to be able to engage it well, not just so we can know scripture, but so that we can know you, so that we can follow, so that we can learn from, that we can experience you more. In Jesus' name, amen.